Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Today, we're going to learn more about hatches than you might have thought was possible. That's right, this is a deep dive hatch tutorial. So even if you think you know everything about hatches, stay tuned. Now, you might be wondering why we have sort of a beginner base and not one of my typical tutorial debug maps with all the whiz bang features like automatic oxygen generation. And that's because I wanted to go through the beginning steps of the game, get the necessary research just in case it might give me a couple of ideas of what the new player might be experiencing when starting hat trenching for the first time. And it paid off because I do have a couple of extra tips that I wouldn't have necessarily remembered. We're gonna start off like we normally do in our database. It's important that we have a baseline knowledge of hatches so that we can have a foundation as we learn more and more about this very versatile critter. Now the database does a great job of teaching us. For instance, hatches eat just about everything and they excrete solid coal. And this one fact makes them one of the best critters for your early game. We can also see that they have a very large livable range going from minus 30 to 70 degrees. Once again, making them very versatile. Unlike our friend the mealwood, which is another popular early game food staple that only goes from 10 to 30 degrees. When they die, they drop 3,200 calories worth of meat. And this meat becomes a staple in even some of the late game foods such as the wonderful Surf and Turf and the awe-inspiring Frost Burger. But for most of your games, you're going to be sticking to the meat with the delightfully smoky aftertaste, and that's barbecue. One important thing to note about the hatches while we're in this database is they can eat just about everything. You'll see that on just the standard hatch, they'll eat just about any food that your dupes leave laying around the colony. This is another important point. If you don't store all of your early food inside this ration box, or maybe you like to leave some meal lice laying around, the hatches will definitely eat it. But while they can eat just about as much barbecue as your dupes, you really don't want them to be eating this type of food. To highlight this fact, notice that they'll eat 700 calories worth of barbecue, but they'll only produce 131 grams of coal. Whereas some of the stuff that you want to be feeding them, for instance, here's some sandstone, they'll eat 140 kilos worth of sandstone, giving you 70 kilos worth of coal. And that's the primary reason of why. Excuse me, Lyra, I need to show something off. You too, Marie, thank you very much. Because in the early game, your coal generator is one of the best sources of power that you'll have access to. And before you get smart batteries, that coal generator is going to run 100% of the time. Well, as long as it has coal. But it'll consume 1 kilo of coal per second. Well, with 600 seconds in a cycle, that means you can run one coal generator flat out for only 600 kilos worth of coal. Which seems like a lot until you realize that 9 hatches being fed properly can run one coal generator flat out forever. Because those 9 hatches are producing 630 kilos worth of coal per cycle. Now you can leave all your hatches just running around. In fact, this is a strategy that's not often used. Hypothetically, you could put your hatches into a space like this, and as long as it's large enough for the amount of hatches, and you keep dropping off more food, for instance, dirt, they'll continuously consume it and produce more coal. But this isn't exactly the best way of doing things. Even if it still produces the coal, that you'll need for your coal generator. And the reason why is because yes, the hatches are great at producing that coal, but they're also great at producing the meat. So why not get both benefits? So where do we start in this whole process? First, it's gonna be the research tree. You're gonna need to have the grooming station and the critter drop off. It's also helpful to have the critter feeder and you're probably gonna wanna keep researching to gain access to the incubator as well. More on that in a little bit. And this is probably what some of your beginning stables look like. All you need to do is drop a grooming station into a room and it'll turn the room into a stable. In fact, as long as that room is 12 tiles or larger and 96 tiles or smaller and has a grooming station, the room will become a stable. And why is that important? because the grooming station is required to ranch these hatches. Also required in ranching, and normally what you might be waiting on longer, is you'll need at least one duplicate trained in Critter Ranching 1, which is locked behind another skill of improved farming. 
But when the dupe does gain access to Critter Ranching 1, it enables them to be able to use the grooming station and to wrangle critters. It also gives them a plus two in husbandry. And it's important that they can wrangle critters in order to use the critter drop-off. You can see in this critter drop-off, we have hatches and hatchlings selected. In other words, the adult form of the critter and the baby form. So we're going to go ahead and wrangle up a few hatches and put them inside this small stable. In fact, here's three right here. Ranchers will then wrangle the critters and then anybody else can grab the critters and put them in their little bags like Gene just did and then drop them right off at the critter drop off. Going back to our room overlay, we can see now that there is three critters inside this stable and you might be wondering why the ranchers aren't doing anything with these hatchlings, and that's because they're wild babies. A critter has to be an adult before they can be groomed. So to expedite this example, we are going to re-wrangle one of these critters, and we have a critter drop-off here set on a priority of six. So this time when this critter gets wrangled, they're going to be dropped off to the critter drop-off with the higher priority. And then we're going to come down here and grab one of these adult hatches. Now notice it's burrowed. This is what happens when hatches have a natural floor. And it's the reason why you want to have a bunch of solid tiles in your stables. Because when a hatch is burrowed, they are not eligible to be groomed. Also important to know that they only burrow during the daytime, as they are nocturnal creatures by nature. And now that we have an adult hatch, Marie is grooming it. All nice and shiny, way to go hatch. So what does this do? Well, now that the hatch is groomed, they're gonna be losing 55% of wildness per cycle. You'll also notice that they don't have to be groomed again for another 1.3 cycles. And that length of time is based on Marie's skill in husbandry. When we select Marie and we go over to their skills tab, all the way down to their grooming effect duration, you can see that it has plus 30%. This is important because you want your ranchers to have as high of a ranching skill as possible. That way they don't have to come and groom these critters quite as often. Because if you're in a colony with a lot of critters, it can be a substantial dupe labor cost for all these ranchers to go around to every single stable, grooming every single critter. I'm going to go ahead and fast forward for a few until we get to the point where all of these critters need to be groomed and we have one that is now tame. And it's happened. This hatch has been groomed enough to where they are now tame, which is important because a few things change on the hatch panel when that happens. Remember when I said you could just put hatches in a room like this and they would eat and produce coal just like normal? Well, there's a caveat to that. And that is with their metabolism. When critters are tame, they eat a lot more. If we go down to the calorie display that is now unlocked because the critter is tame, you can see they are now metabolizing 700 calories per cycle, unlike when they were wild. But it also means that if you don't feed these critters, they will starve. Also take note of the little band that the hatch now has, unlike their wild counterparts, that have no band. Another difference between these wild hatches and the tame hatches is you can now see their reproduction panel. When hatches are tame, they lay eggs a lot more as well. In fact, a tame and happy hatch has a 15% increased reproduction rate for a total of 17%, which comes out to be that they'll lay an egg every 5.88 cycles, which is an important bit of math. But now we need to make sure that these hatches don't starve. And when we have a critter feeder inside of a stable, we can load it up with food. In fact, two tons of food at a time. In this example, we're going to start off with sandstone. And this is easy enough. We go down to hatch, we select sandstone. Although sandstone might not be what you choose to feed your hatches to start off with. More on that in a little while. But now that the critter feeder is loaded up with food, this tame hatch goes right up to it and starts eating. Take note that the wild critters will not eat from the critter feeder, only the tame ones. And then when they finally do eat, they're going to lay you that 70 kilos, give or take, of coal that they've been waiting to excrete. With all three critters tamed and happy, you'll notice that their reproduction rate is up, their metabolism up, and everything is good. This is all you really need to start off your hatch ranching. There's going to be a problem though, and that problem is going to rear its head as soon as one of these critters 
lays an egg. Let's go ahead and fast forward so we can see what kind of predicament that will be in. This hatch is now at 99% reproduction, and we're about to see one of the biggest mysteries in Ani. And that is, how does that small hatch lay an egg that size? That's gotta hurt. But you'll notice there's now a problem with these hatches. They are now considered cramped. And the reason why they're cramped is because these hatches don't have enough space in this stable for the number of hatches that are currently in the stable plus the egg. Every hatch needs 12 tiles worth of space. This stable is 36 tiles large, so it has enough space to fully support three hatches. But because the egg has been laid and they're feeling cramped, every single hatch now has a 0% reproduction rate. So it's important that you get rid of these hatches. To highlight this point, we're going to go ahead and open up 12 more tiles worth of space. With the extra space available, the critters are no longer feeling cramped and everything is good. But remember, there's a maximum size of stables. And so while this one could now hold four critters, and the critters can sense that this is in fact a critter, so eventually when your stable's at 96 tiles, remembering of course that the stable's max size is 96 tiles, Using some simple math, you can see that you can hold eight critters. So why don't we go ahead and expand this and see what happens with all eight critters. And here's what that looks like. You'll notice this stable is 96 tiles and that there's only six critters inside of this room. But remember earlier when I said that the critters can burrow? This is yet another reason why they need to have a tile there. Because while they are burrowed, they will not be able to become groomed. They will also not count as far as being a part of the stable when they are burrowed as they are quite literally no longer in the room so why don't we get these replaced with some tiles and then see what happens and here we are and even though you'll notice that there's only six critters in here there's still enough eggs so that the hatches believe there's actually 11 critters in here because remember each of these eggs represents a potential critter and once that happens the hatches become cramped again and that is too many because as we said before eight is the magic number so what do we do to get rid of all of these eggs so that these hatches can get back to the business of laying more eggs and typically in the early game this is going to be your solution this is the egg cracker the egg cracker will take any of your excess eggs and create raw eggs from them why don't we queue up one of these and see what happens a dupe comes by drops off an egg cracks it open and we're given one eggshell and one raw egg and duplicates can't eat raw egg despite them being able to eat just about everything else that's where we turn to our electric grill we can then take every single raw egg and turn it into a 2800 calorie omelet we'll queue up one omelet the raw egg will be loaded up and somebody's going to come by and make an omelet and that's a potential solution but you have to be careful because if you continuously grab all the hatchling eggs for instance by selecting forever on this eventually you would have eaten all the eggs and not have any other hatches to replace these hatches when the time comes because remember they only live for 100 cycles and eventually you're going to want a baby hatch to come in here to replace this one that's where the critter incubator comes into play unfortunately the incubators have to be created with refined metal so this is going to be one of your early uses of refined metal and perhaps one of your first reasons to get a rock crusher or a metal refinery up but once you have your incubators complete we can then start throwing hatchling eggs into them. For now, we'll start with two hatchling eggs, and the reason why we have two, based on two unpowered incubators, is because remember, each hatch lives for 100 cycles. Well, at a change per cycle rate of 5%, in an unpowered incubator, it takes a hatchling egg 20 cycles to hatch, which means each incubator will provide five hatches within that 100 cycle span. Well, in this stable, we only need eight critters in a 100 cycle span to replace all the critters we actually have. So if we place these incubators on a priority of six and we have our egg cracker on five, we can then be safe in setting this to forever because if there's an incubator available, the duplicates will grab the egg and put it in the incubator before they'll throw it into the egg cracker. This is the very important setup that you have, but once you do that, you then have a safe and effective method to get rid of the hatchling eggs, knowing that you're going to be able to reproduce all the hatches this stable needs, and you're going to have a steady source of omelets. So we'll also select the electric grill and put omelets on forever. So how many omelets is that going to give us and how many can that feed? Well, here's some more beginner hatch math for you. 
we know that every hatch is going to lay an egg every 5.88 cycles. With 8 hatches in this stable, we know that's 8 eggs every 5.88 cycles. We also know that the egg is going to be turned into a raw egg, which is then going to create 2800 calories worth of omelets. So if we take 8 eggs times it by 2800 calories, we're given 22,400 calories. But remember, we only get that many eggs every 5.88 cycles on average. So we divide that 22,400 by 5.88 and we're given about 3,800 calories per cycle. Another way you can get to the same answer is we know that each hatch is going to lay an egg on average of once every 5.88 cycles. Well, if we take 8 hatches, divide it by 5.88, we're given 1.36 eggs per cycle. Well, we know that each egg can produce us 2,800 calories worth of omelets, so we take the 1.36, multiply it times the 2,800 calories, and once again, we're given about 3,800 calories. Which means for every stable of 8 hatches, you can feed 3.8 duplicants on omelets. But this is just an estimation, because in between groomings, the hatch becomes glum. And with 8 hatches, there's gonna be a little bit of downtime between groomings occasionally at the grooming station. To highlight this example, we've just disabled the grooming station. But once a hatch goes too long without being groomed, they become glum. And because they aren't as happy as they were before, they're only going to be laying eggs at a reproduction rate of 2% per cycle instead of the 17% a cycle. So I believe most people estimate when you're using hatches for omelets, you can use a good figure of three and a half duplicates for every stable on omelets. There's also been a change in a recent patch which has helped mitigate this issue a little bit. And that's when there is a critter being groomed, another critter will get in line. You can see right now that this hatch in line is glum, waiting to be groomed as well. So it helps speed up the grooming cycle and saves time on dupe labor because no longer does the ranch have to whistle and wait for the critter to come all the way over. And it's for this reason that you used to see a tile and a door in most of your hatch ranches. That way all the critters were hanging out in this area so they didn't have to go very far to get groomed. This tile was being used on top of the door because hatches could actually jump over the doors. So if you didn't put the tile there, the critters could just jump out of this space. Also as a note, that when you add these three tiles, you have to push out your stable by three tiles. For instance, you can see that this stable is only 92 tiles in size. So you'd actually have to create a larger stable to account for the additional tile and door. I don't think it's actually necessary though anymore. With the addition of the critter queuing system, there's always a critter waiting to be groomed in line after the first one. So yeah, the first critter may be further away, but the second critter is going to be sitting right there waiting to be groomed. So I don't believe you necessarily have to use the old door and tile trick, but it may save you just a little bit of time when the rancher first gets to the stable. But there's a whole nother reason why you still may want to use the door and the tile trick and we'll get to that in a few minutes as well. Remember that our egg cracker was only collecting hatchling eggs. Well, hatches have a chance to lay other types of eggs. When we go to the egg chances section for the hatch, you can see that there's actually a 2% chance that they're gonna lay in a stone hatchling egg whenever they eat sedimentary rock. And right now, this one has a 12% chance of laying a sage hatchling egg because they've been eating dirt. And as a matter of fact, they have laid a sage hatchling egg. And we know the problems those can create. So when you're using this method, make sure you select all those other eggs as well. That's also why it's a real good reason when you do set up these new stables, go ahead and sweep everything out. And that way the hatches don't eat anything that you don't want them to eat, such as the dirt. Now's probably a good time to start talking about all the variants of the hatch. When we go to a hatch's information panel, you can see all the stuff that they are willing to eat. And you'll notice the things that the hatch wants to eat is sand, sandstone, clay, crushed rock, dirt, sedimentary rock, and then all those valuable foods. Well, these items aren't necessarily the stuff that you want to be giving away to hatches. You can only get so much dirt in your colony. Sandstone's valuable as a building resource. We all know how valuable sand is. In other words, it'd be better if we didn't have to feed our tamed critters the materials that we want to use. 
Insert the stone hatch. Stone hatch don't care. They'll eat sedimentary rock, igneous rock, obsidian, granite. In other words, a lot of these materials that you have a lot of because so much of your planetoid is made out of it. And because you have so much granite and igneous rock, for instance, it's normally best to transition to stone hatches as soon as possible. And how do you do that? Well, as we've shown before, when a regular hatch eats sedimentary rock, they're more likely to lay a stone hatchling egg. So what you do is you have your normal stable, and then you set up a second stable, and you have incubators ready to start accepting stone hatchling eggs. And then you have that new stable only accepting stone hatches and stone hatchlings. An important note though, is you will not be able to select stone hatchlings on the incubator until you've discovered them. Likewise, you won't be able to select stone hatches or stone hatchlings on your critter drop-off until you've discovered them as well. Okay, so I want to start feeding my hatches sedimentary rock. And that is the key ingredient because it's the only thing that will allow you to start getting stone hatches. Once you have stone hatches, they're more likely to lay more stone hatchling eggs. Well, a lot of planetoids don't start off with sedimentary rock right near you. In fact, you're most likely to find it in some of your swampy biomes. You can see here, this swamp biome here has a lot of sedimentary rock that we can use. But Echo, what if my planetoid doesn't come with any swamp biomes? Well, then your last resort is this ration box. The ration box that comes on every single colony is made up out of, yes, sedimentary rock. So you deconstruct it, throw it into a critter feeder with just one hatch. That way, this hatch eats all of that sedimentary rock and gives you a better chance that they're going to lay a stone hatchling egg before they die or before you run out of sedimentary rock. All right, so you've laid your first stone hatchling egg, but we've already said that it takes 20 cycles for a stone hatchling egg to hatch. I don't want to wait that long, because not to mention, once you have that first stone hatchling, it would take you a significant amount of time to fill up an entire stable. That's where powering your incubators comes in handy. Once your incubator is powered, a rancher will come by and hug the incubator. Oh, isn't that sweet? And once that egg is hugged, you'll notice that it gets a lullaby tag, which increases the incubation rate by 400%. So instead of an unpowered incubator that takes 20 cycles to hatch, because its incubation rate is 5%, when you have a lullaby egg, it now has a total incubation rate of 25% per cycle. So we're going to get one new egg every four cycles. This is definitely a way to increase your reproduction rate very quickly. In fact, if you didn't care about the power, you could just run one powered incubator. Because one powered incubator, based off it producing one egg every four cycles, is going to give you 25 hatches in 100 cycles. Which is enough to support three stables of eight hatches each. That's not too shabby for 240 watts. But you can even get better than that once you unlock a little bit of automation. By using a timer sensor, we can control when the incubator is powered and when it is not. When the timer sensor turns green, the incubator is powered. And this is important because when the incubator is powered, the rancher will come and hug the egg. And that is the only time they can give that egg the lullaby tag. But once that timer reaches the end of its green cycle, we're not paying the power cost for this incubator, yet this egg is still lullabied and still incubating at a rate of 25% per cycle. Now note, you want your red duration at 600, in other words, one full cycle, because your lullaby lasts for one whole cycle. A lot of people think that you want to make this total to 600, but what would happen if you did this, by the time it turned green again, this egg would still be lullabied, which means the rancher wouldn't come hug it again. For your green duration, make it long enough so that your rancher has time to get the errand and get all the way up here. So you have a couple of options. Increase the priority of the incubator so the rancher gets the errand immediately, or increase the green duration long enough, say 60 seconds, so they have enough time to get the errand and get up here to lullaby the egg before the incubator loses power. But note, the longer that green duration is on, the more power you're going to be consuming. There's a couple of other variants that are worth noting. First, the Sage Hatchling. The Sage Hatchling is nearly identical to the Stone Hatch and the Standard Hatch. The only difference? They eat organic type of items. For instance, dirt, 
slime, algae, fertilizer, and polluted dirt. And in some niche use cases, they can come in handy. For instance, turning all that slime into coal, turning any extra algae into coal, or even getting rid of all that unwanted polluted dirt. Note though, you're bound to have some polluted oxygen if you start loading these things up with slime and polluted dirt. And then finally is the smooth hatchling. Now the smooth hatch is a little bit different. They don't produce coal at all. In fact, what they excrete is based on what they eat. If they eat copper ore, they're going to excrete refined copper. Same thing for gold amalgam, iron ore, wolframite, aluminum ore, and cobalt ore. And they refine that metal at 75% efficiency, which is better than our rock crusher, but not quite as good as our metal refinery. Of note, in order to get your first sage hatch egg, you need to be feeding your hatches dirt. But to get to your smooth hatches, you have to feed your stone hatches any of those ores. And when you do that, their chances of laying a smooth hatching egg increase. So to recap that, regular hatches can lay regular hatch eggs, sage hatch eggs, and stone hatch eggs. But it takes a stone hatch in order to lay a smooth hatchling egg for the very first time. So far, we've covered a lot. You can go in a lot of different directions with these four style of hatches. And if we estimated that each of these stables can produce us enough omelets for three and a half dupes each, these four stables are enough for 14 duplicates. But what if I told you there's a way to get even better than that? And that's from barbecue. The difference here is if we crack every egg, it becomes a 2800 calorie omelet. But if we allowed every egg to hatch and then every hatch to die, we'd be getting 3200 calories worth of meat, which then turns into 4000 calories worth of barbecue. And this will naturally happen in your stables. As these hatches reach old age and die, they will produce meat. Then your ranchers will come over here to the incubator that'll have a hatch waiting for them, pick it up, drop it back into your stable, continuing the circle of life. But we can then take that excess meat over to the electric grill and make barbecue. Note though, that your dupes can eat raw meat, unlike the raw egg. But it is much better to turn it into barbecue because it is a plus three good quality food that equals plus eight to morale. So how do we take all those eggs and most effectively turn them into meat without waiting the 20 cycles for them to incubate and then the 100 cycles for them to die? One method might be having an automatic dispenser set on sweep only. And whenever you see an egg in one of these stables, you mark it for sweeping, they'll come and drop it off at this automatic dispenser where the eggs will sit here until they become hatches and then you just need to wait 100 cycles for them to evolve into meat. You could also, instead of waiting for them to die of old age, come in here periodically with your dupes, kill all the hatchlings, producing a bunch of meat at once. Surely there's a better way to getting meat than that. And there is, once you have access to some shipping. And that's with the invention of this little device here. Sometimes called a drowning chamber, but more often than not, the more pleasant sounding evolution chamber. We have some shipping reels here going to a conveyor chute where all of the eggs are being delivered. When the eggs hatch, the hatchling quickly discovers that they can't breathe underwater and then will soon die. Once they die, they'll turn into meat, which can then be delivered directly to this electric grill. And one of the methods of getting all those eggs to the evolution chamber is via those rails using the auto sweepers and conveyor loaders. Each of the conveyor loaders have critter eggs selected, so whenever the auto sweeper sees any critter eggs, it picks them up, throws them in the conveyor loader. The eggs then make the trip down through the rails and into the container full of water. One note is you need to have enough water and a door in place so that hatches just don't jump out. Another benefit of having the auto sweepers inside your ranches is because they will then go through the work of taking the food from the storage bin and loading it into the critter feeders. And because of this, you can take the critter feeders and put them on a priority of one. That way the duplicates aren't likely to do it. But as I said before, there is something to be said for putting the tile in the door here and moving all the hatches into this area here. First of all, Marie didn't have to whistle as long to get the first smooth hatchling up here to be groomed, but also because then it only takes one auto sweeper to reach the entire area where there will actually be an egg laid. And for that reason, you wouldn't have to add multiple conveyor loaders and multiple auto sweepers per stable. But it does take a little bit more space 
as you can see the difference between these four stables. A couple of other important notes is it still takes a long time for this system to get underway. For instance, this hatchling egg is only at 26% incubation. As such, it's going to take another 15 cycles for this one hatchling egg to hatch. And as more eggs come drop in, there'll be a sort of tempo to how often your eggs are hatching. You can see right now there's 25 eggs in this room. So you will be waiting a little while before the incubation cycles start to catch up and you're providing that steady stream of meat to your electric grill. Speaking of meat, how much food can we expect out of using this system versus our omelet system? We once again go back to the fact that each hatch lays an egg every 5.88 cycles. And that one egg will eventually turn into 3200 calories worth of meat, which will then cook to 4000 calories of barbecue. So if we take that 4000 calories worth of barbecue that we'll know we'll get from each hatch, times that by eight hatches, we're given 32,000 calories. Well, when we divide that by the 5.88, we're given 5,442 calories per cycle. So that means every stable will produce enough barbecue for a little over five dupes. Of note though, that 5.88 average is not 100% accurate. And the reason why, if you remember, is there's going to be some times that you have baby hatchlings inside your stables and they don't lay eggs. So if you just include the adult period of all the hatches during that 95 cycles worth of adulthood, that 5.88 average is reduced down to 5.58. The difficult thing about that sort of math though is because there's too many variables. For instance, you're only going to have baby hatchlings in your stables every once in a while. Additionally, remember, there's going to be times when these stone hatches need to be groomed and they're still sitting at glum. And that's why we sort of swag it that each ranch can support five duplicates on barbecue and three duplicates on omelets. So what else can we do to make this process even more efficient? Remember our incubator here that's sitting unpowered? We can use the power of the critter sensor inside of the stable instead of the timer sensor in order to tell the incubator when to power on. In this setup, you tell the critter sensor to only turn green if the count of critters in here is below eight. Once there's, for instance, only seven critters in here because one died, it'll send a green signal over to this incubator telling it to turn on. It'll then stay powered so the rancher can come lullaby it until that next hatch is born and then dropped off in the stable in which then another egg will be loaded up but will not power until we have another critter that's ready. We can even combine the two methods of automation using that timer sensor and the critter sensor. In this example we have an AND gate. So now only when this stable needs a critter and only when it's time to lullaby this incubator will this incubator be powered on. Another change that happened once we started using this system is we're no longer competing with the egg cracker for the eggs. So these incubators can stay on five because no matter what, whenever there's an empty incubator, the rancher is going to come to this pool here, grab the appropriate egg that it needs and load up the incubator that's in need. Of note, adding a light above your grooming station doesn't increase the speed at which Gossman here can groom those critters. And yes, I even timed it on a stopwatch. Also speaking of speed, you'll notice Gossman has nothing to do. And I've made it to where Gossman is the only rancher in this colony. While yes, they do have critter ranching too, which gives them an automatic plus four to husbandry. Two from critter ranching one and two from critter ranching two. With only a total husbandry of seven, they are able to groom all of these critters and lullaby the incubators and still have a significant portion of idle time in their colony. And I was able to test this by making sure the rancher couldn't do anything else but ranching. And I think this is due to the fact that since the recent patch, critters will now get in line in order to be groomed, making the whole process a lot quicker. Additionally, several patches ago, they made it to where ranchers would actually level up in their husbandry just from doing grooming errands which makes it so the grooming lasts longer on each critter. With just the husbandry of seven, these critters can go 1.7 cycles before needing to be groomed again. And that's only gonna get better and better the more this rancher gets better. Depending on the dupe situation in your colony though, I would still recommend two ranchers and making sure that they are on separate schedules 
That way, even when one rancher is busy eating, using the bathroom, or sleeping, all the ranching is still being done, further minimizing the time that these critters are glum. A fun little note, when a critter is in line, it gets the excited buff, which proves that critters like being ranched. So despite all the obvious benefits, such as all the coal they produce, their eggshells, which will eventually turn into lime, the meat and barbecue, or even raw eggs and omelets that you're given, ranching hatches is just a good thing to do. I hope you learned a lot in this tutorial. And I know it was a bit longer because I know there's a lot that goes into properly taking care of these hatches. So let me know if I missed something or if you have any questions and I'll answer those in the comments below. So until our next tutorial, I'll talk to you soon.